Um, can I come back to Rami about uh, what do you think are the developing trends in the off-grid sector? Because you were talking about a holistic approach to uh, the diesel gensets, the gas plants, um, off-grid, etc. So, what's required to make uh, solar plus storage bankable? That's the second question. The, the first thing is about the off-grid sector uh, in UAE. What are your thoughts about it? Yeah, so uh, definitely the, what is happening now that the fuel prices in UAE and Saudi like 10 years back, not like a five year, not like now. So what happened uh, today that we are seeing for the first time in UAE that the diesel price is crossing $1 uh, per liter. And in the microgrid uh, segment, when we have, this is one of the main criteria in, in doing simulation and doing optimization for an off-grid system. Once you have uh, like an off-grid plant running on diesel with one, uh, one dollar, this is where it's, where it's feasible. This is where you should uh, actually put uh, like uh, PV, you, can, you should uh, explore the, the storage component and you should do the optimization, what will be the, the most, uh, let's say, feasible uh, solution at the end of the day. And this is, this is part of our uh, design inside Rolls-Royce. This is, we have a full dedicated team uh, of simulation that is actually optimizing uh, and fetching for the lowest uh, possible uh, LCOE. And uh, we are, depend on the client uh, at the end target because uh, at the end of the day, we have a report that show to you like the reduction of the OPEX and the reduction of the LCOE and at the end of the day, the break even, like how many years you're gonna get your money back. So, and it depends who is like, what is more interesting to our client. And this is how, how we follow the simulation. Is it like the break even more? So uh, you're gonna optimize a bit in the storage and you're gonna make like more PV. It depends on the, definitely the pricing of, of PV and storage inside the country. And what happened to the storage recently that the prices of storage have gone up. So it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a game that is, you know, changing every day and the dynamics of, of the market is, is changing day by day and week by week. So fuel prices are changing. Uh, storage prices are lithium ion battery now. It's, uh, it's changing actually every two weeks. You can see prices increase, but we're gonna hopefully uh, see like prices uh, decrease by the end of the year. So hopefully that the market will be stable again for battery storage. So it's, it's, uh, it's a tailored uh, made solution, especially for, for off-grid system. You, you cannot uh, sell it as, as uh, similar to PV. Uh, you're gonna say this is uh, like a, a one mega uh, plant and you're gonna have an IRR of that and the, the cost is like increased by 10%, so this is the cost now. No, off-grid system was, was a micro-grid uh, concept. It's totally, um, it, it have a very different approach and you should be patient and you should actually listen to your clients and you should listen to the client's needs and, and start optimizing and fetching for the best fit uh, solution at the end of the day. Thanks, thanks Rami. Sham, from your side, do you see off-grid projects coming up for um, on a developer mode or pure capex mode? We've seen a lot of inquiries for off-grid, though. We get quite a few of them coming in from Saudi, from Iraq, uh, and Northern Emirates as well. We've actually, honestly, we've chosen not to act on them simply because uh, till about two years back, they, the numbers weren't working out, specifically for clients in the Northern Emirates who were soon to get to the grid and they were just deferring it by three to five years uh, because at times what happens in these countries is they drop the connection fees and then the grid connection becomes as feasible as pulling the cable up to your uh, facility and going ahead with it. On-grid solar is our specialization. We've worked on a couple of off-grid projects but that's not our area of expertise. So I'd probably defer this question to somebody who actually acts on these inquiries as opposed to us passing it on. Amit, any particular views on the off-grid segment? 
See, my Shyam has mentioned that uh, we are more so on an on grid, so means uh, on OPEX model and a connection to the grid. Off grid, we are not focusing as of now, so that's not a problem. Because there's always talk about net zero carbon where people want to make sure that they control carbon even at the construction stage. So there's an increasing focus on reducing diesel usage even during the construction phase, etc. So I think it's something which will pick up pace as the whole net zero, net zero carbon initiative start to take place. And more and more buildings have aspirations to achieve the green building standards and not only green building, also go further into net zero and net zero carbon. Now, coming back to a big factor on the EPC side. Now, when the serious amount of bidding that goes on in winning a project, and very often there is a real focus uh, on price competitiveness. In the midst of all this, how can we ensure that the solar plants are built to last and realize the very competitive assumptions that are made to justify the low prices at the bidding stage? Uh, from the EPC and quality of the project, and to make sure that you know, it runs for 25 years, what are the things that you can do even in a highly competitive marketplace? Uh, well, Manoj, uh, we have seen uh, many solar projects built here. Uh, we have, uh, I mean, everyone of us have seen uh, the you know, issues with respect to the, the projects which are built. So it's very important, uh, I mean, everyone says if you, I mean, when you meet clients, when you meet uh, people, everyone thinks solar is very simple. Yes, solar is simple, but the quality uh, measures to be taken, the component selection, uh, the design, the way it's installed, everything comes into, uh, everything takes a, a you know, big uh, role, uh, especially with respect to the EPC companies or even the developers. So uh, everyone, uh, the, the companies here have a uh, quality procedure which they want to keep. Um, so what we have seen is in the initial uh, phases, uh, you know, the, the, the projects have been built. Uh, that's when the, the regulations came in. There has been issues. There has been uh, issues with respect to the, the, the installation and the, the design itself. But uh, uh, those projects are still live. I mean, there has been some um, rework done by, you know, let's say the, uh, the developers or the, the client itself who had uh, uh, procured the project or, you know, or the project were refinanced. So uh, that's where we come in. I mean, we basically, I mean, Sham has been doing a great job here. So we, uh, we believe that being a consultant, having a consultant for projects helps to have a third party assistance uh, in terms of selecting the components. Everyone talks about co cost competitiveness, but uh, when, you know, when the numbers come down, you also make, need to make sure that uh, you get the right product and you know, it, it, is, it is there for the lifetime of the project. So you see a lifetime of 20 or 25 years. So one of the challenges which we have seen uh, in the market has been uh, with respect to the OINTM of the project. Uh, the OINTM management has been uh, is, is a drive which we have seen um, that uh, the right teams need to be uh, put in to, to, to manage the project, to clean the project, to maintain uh, the components, and uh, you, you get the right energy for the project. So uh, there has been a lack of OEM, uh, let's say, contractors, or I mean, there are people, respected companies, doing the right job in the in the market. But there has also been the other phase where uh, the life of the plant has been really affected uh, due to the uh, uh, you know, let's say, not following the right principles. So we are also working with uh, uh, the, the 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 projects here. 100 to 150, 200 mega, which is already installed. We are working with clients. We are getting inquiries where they want us to, who have installed solar PV projects, apart from the developers, to, to uh, do a, a technical due diligence for their project, their system, so that the value of the, you know, the plant, uh, the solar PV plant and the facility is, is intact. And so, so we are engaging with them. And they, they prefer uh, a consultant to, to be involved in managing the OEM service rather than considering it as a you know a, a simple cleaning uh, process. So uh, I think uh, this is something where uh, the team and the, the industry itself needs to put a uh, thought about and you know let's say bring out uh, right principles so that you know we have uh, real uh, projects on the on the on the ground. Thanks, Rahul. Your views on. How do we ensure quality while still maintaining the highly competitive price bidding? Look, ultimately through solar, 
we are selling a commodity, we are selling electricity, so price matters, right? So it doesn't matter if your plant is beautiful, aesthetic versus someone else's plant that is not looking very great but still producing the same amount of electricity because that is what you are selling. So, but that being said, uh, we have to realize there is a lot of education that goes into especially to end customers. So as an EPC contractor, my clients are developers who are pretty proficient themselves because maintaining the plant uh, for them is a key criteria as they generate more and end clients. So for us, it's more about educating the end customers, people, so that they understand the price that they're paying for and the deliverables that they're getting. So as far, as long as they are clear on that, uh, then it is up to the customer and the client to uh, choose what they want. Uh, to give you an example, for example, some things that are not, uh, you know, immediately uh, uh, understandable, people uh, understand this. On the roof, when we're talking about specifically such hot, humid climates, uh, when temperature goes to 45 degree, necessarily the roofing sheet temperature is not 45 degree. It may go up to 55, 57 degrees. Uh, so there are component selection questions that have uh, come up because of that. For example, if you're using some, so on panels and inverters, obviously there's a lot of focus on selecting the right components, but there are a lot of small, small, uh, maybe C-class items which can actually ultimately end up impacting the performance of your plants. Uh, as small as like walkway material selection. If you have an FRP walkway, it may get brittle when it's constantly exposed to 65 degree weather. So you need maybe more, uh, you know, points for interconnection rather than when you're looking at a steel walkway where you may end up paying uh, slightly more at the starting. But if you don't take these points into consideration, so that comes from educating the client and educating the customer. Uh, more so, but ultimately, as I said, this is a commodity and we all ultimately have to be competitive because we are competing with conventional grid electricity. Um, Amit, as a developer, what do you do to make sure that the, the, the quality is maintained? Do you do seasonal or periodic audits to ensure that the quality on day one is still being maintained after year five, year ten, etc.? Very important point, uh, Manoj, this uh, after building of a project, the I call it asset management, not as operation maintenance. Uh, there is a need to maintain the asset because over the period of next 10, 15, 20 years, we have to maintain the asset. And, uh, you know, I say if we are maintaining the asset in a good mode, we can increase the revenue. Means we can increase the generation and the generation will give the good revenue. So. Overall, to maintain the asset, uh, yeah, certainly we do the periodic audits. We are uh, going for the ISO certifications also. We are um, implementing a net zero policy also and uh, uh, zero water. That is me. something we are implementing the robotic systems for all the clinics. So, no, you know, the manual cleaning and a robotic cleaning, there's a difference. So, it will be automated and the proper cleaning can be done. So maintaining the asset is a key factor after building a project. If we do it properly, uh, we can maintain it as a years long, whatever the contractual period is. Okay, thank you. Now just opening up to the audience, if you have any questions, please raise your hand. You can ask the panel uh, any questions you have on the CNI sector in the industry. How do we ensure that the best talent is attracted, mentored, and promoted to grow in the solar industry for the future? If you could just touch upon what you and your company are doing to attract talent into this industry. Starting with you, Mohammed. Thank you. Uh, for this approaching, like each community or segment, again, we go back to the segmentation of the customers or potential customers. And then there is a need and there is, uh, there is a demand and there is a need and we have to fulfill that needs for the, from the customer perspective. Uh, costing is very important, what they discuss about the APC part. And uh, in, in solar market, uh, we, through the past few years, we were on a roller coaster. Prices goes up, prices goes down, goes up, goes down. You don't know what's going on. There's supply and demands. And, uh, we face a very big problem during COVID and during the close-up of the uh, Shanghai port. So uh, there was a lot of suffering because we are actually indirectly, we run many subcontractors in, in several countries. So we know the pain of APC company, what they go through to get the supplies they need and make it available for them. So it, it, it's more or less... Um, 
you can say uh, each party has to do their role. Whether you are a trader that brings, buy the material from China and bring it here as a, as a trader or as a procurement company, you have to make the best price available for these EPC companies who they are fighting for pennies of profit to make ends meet. Uh, same thing at, at the customer end. Uh, the prices has to be suitable for them to be able to pay for this cost, whether it's on-grid or off-grid. So we have to do more or less a reverse engineering uh, part to make this available for the customer at the right price. We don't control all the items, but at least the items that we can affect or influence, we definitely have to uh, you know, use our strength to make this value for the customer and bring the best value for the best price. And the affordable price. If it's not affordable, to go toward the investment part and financing uh, on a lease to own option, for example. It doesn't have to be uh, to the model that is currently available for the past few years. Like, I, I'm not against anybody, Siraj Financing or Yaradors or anybody else. I'm just talking in general. It, we have to uh, also cater for the current market situation. Maybe the lease to own option would be more attractive to the customer now rather than 15 years discount of 50%. The customer would feel the ownership uh, of these assets. He would take care of it, clean it, make the proper, maybe uh, hiring of some maintenance company to, pay, to, pay, to, to do the proper you know, uh, maintenance of the system. So it, it's more or less uh, a joint effort from all elements of the industry to, to make sure this could be uh, successful and have more growth in the future as well. Yeah. Thank you. Sham, can you touch on talent, attracting talent into the industry? Look, to be honest, I'm actually surprised at the number of solar companies in this particular region considering the number of megawatts in this region. So there's an inverse disparity over here already. There's already enough uh, talent available considering the scale of our deployment. Uh, and another thing is, uh, I mean, we're a part of this industry, I'm a part of this industry as well, but I don't find it to be an extremely specialized industry. Basically for us to train an MEP person to start doing DC cabling and become a solar contractor is not even a three, four month long job if you've got your lessons learned and everything ready. So it's a game of scaling up. If you're scaling up and attracting talent in a country where the megawatts look bleak, you're on the wrong path. But if you simply want to ask how to bring the right guys, there are sufficient guys here already. Uh, good specialized skill set. And I think through, so what's happening now with with the social media and the sort of events that we hold, people are watching us from India, they're watching us from Near East, and they want to be a part of this community here because apparently the pay scales here are better than those areas. So they, but what they don't understand is that their megawatts are 100 times more than ours. Like they discuss 50 megawatts on LinkedIn in India as opposed to what a contractor would do here in three years. So they learn a lot over there. Bringing him here is giving him promises of more money, but way more skill set and way more deployment over there. Uh, it's a very personal thing, how to bring people on board and what sort of talent you want, and that's, that's the way your company is going to look like later. We, st we stick to it. We want very specialized, very smart people, very few people. We don't want to bring in a labor force and then have to say bye-bye because this country is stopping the program. But I don't find that as a, any barrier, any hindrance. Uh, good guys are easy to find. Events like this help out. And I believe all of us who are running our show are being bombarded on LinkedIn for, <laughs> to, for guys to get hired. So that per se is not a barrier. But yeah, it's an attractive, it's surprisingly an attractive market, this region. But when I start having discussions with my friends in other countries where the megawatts are so higher, I mean, we, I, we actually have to bow down then because we're not really doing the biggest megawatts as opposed to having the biggest teams here. So that's my opinion. Yeah. Rami, any thoughts from a solar applications perspective as it starts to get into mobility and other areas where you may need to work with other industries as well, um, architects in building integrated uh, solar PV, etc. So you need maybe more talent than what's available today. Yeah, let's, uh, let's admit one point here that um, the, the rise of electricity demand in the next decade, it's gonna be three times what we have already seen in the last decades. So uh, utility now, uh, utility is like an, an regulatory and government, they should realize it's, uh, it's not about a grid operator anymore, it's not about government. They should take, uh, you know, a developer even like 
for CNI business uh, development. Uh, let's not talk about CNI, like the whole distributed energy resource business, and to adopt the idea that it's, uh, it's part of the generation industry. And they should actually start to uh, maximize uh, those uh, kind of developer, because this is, this is how uh, it's going to be implemented in the region. And this is how you're going to grow, and this is how you're going to implement uh, more uh, uh, like generation uh, source, sources in, in the region. And it will not happen by, uh, it, yeah, utility is booming now, but at, at a certain point, they, they couldn't suck all the demand that is happening. So here come the role of, of all the medium scale uh, companies that you are seeing trying to do development, but they are facing a lot of uh, obstacles like from the competitiveness and stuff, but it shouldn't be that way. It should be like each one is complementing each other at the end of the day. And it's like everyone should like accept that this is part of the market and this is how we should move forward. And I believe it's, uh, it's going to be half and half one day, like utility half and the, the, the actually the distributed energy, it's the other half. So this is, in, in my belief, it's, it will happen in 2027, 20, for example, or 2030. Okay, thank you. Any questions from the audience? Okay, I'll, we'll just... Uh, Thanks for all your insight during this panel discussion. I'll just close off with one question, which I hope everybody can answer in one sentence. What do you like the most about the solar industry in the UAE? Starting with you, Rahul. Uh, so I joined this, sorry for one sentence, to give a context, I joined this industry in 2020. So I have seen COVID. And uh, the day I landed, uh, there was regulation restricting the capacity to 2 megawatt came in. And now uh, this year, we've again seen another, uh, uh, let's say, policy decision from Deva, which is not, let's say, very industry uh, friendly. Uh, so all this excitement <laughs> is probably what I'm looking forward to. Yeah, well, uh, to answer your question, Manoj, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about the BIPV industry. I think we didn't touch that. Uh, uh, today, but uh, the BIPV or the, I mean, there's, there's a lot of facades uh, in, in Dubai in, 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 uh, and, you know, we see a lot of interest coming from the consultants and the developers uh, for the BIPV uh, PV project. So this is something which we are working on. I personally have involved in one or two projects. I think, Manoj, you have a better experience in Expo with respect to the architectural solar. So this is something which is exciting. I think, uh, I mean, we, uh, paybacks, et cetera, we'll have to see. I mean, we have to see the numbers on the table, but we, uh, I'm, I'm a firm believer that this is something which we should look forward to. Thanks. It's more so, uh, more sustainable and sustainability solutions. If you keep aside for some time the numbers, this is something you are giving back to the nature and the environment. So, as you asked that most exciting is that is the green energy and we are doing it for the future. That is the one thing. Yeah, what, what I like about UAE market, it's like uh, definitely you, you cannot see, for example, this war room, like it's like you have uh, half of the world nationality, like all are, you know, together. So it's like they are sharing all their, their knowledge and their ideas to UAE. And we believe, yeah, maybe UAE is a bit uh, slow at the moment, but we believe that it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be one of the pioneers. So like all that amount of talent, it's definitely, it's very unique in, the, in UAE, let's say. Thank you. I like two things. They have very large roofs. Uh, you don't get to see these massive 6, 8, 10 megawatt rooftops anywhere else in the world. So luckily in my career we have an 8 megawatt roof and a 17 megawatt roof. That's not going to happen anywhere else in the world. So that's one thing. And the next thing is this country moves in a very, I mean it, it's fast. Uh, while others are still planning and thinking of their policies and already learning from what Dubai probably didn't do right and are tweaking their policies. These guys are already up 500 mega thinking of the next stage. And we're happy to ride this wave, you know. They let us do it 
And now we're riding it. Now we've got all the references through Dubai to now capture the rest of the GCC. Only, in my opinion, Dubai could have done this, and they've done it fantastically. We can crib about the policy issues, but they've let us play. Okay, this is very, very good question to close, and I will close it with uh, something I saw yesterday on the news, and maybe you already, most of you already know that. Uh, unfortunately, because of the global warming and the environment effect that is currently going on in the world, uh, yesterday we seen more than almost 50% of Europe is becoming almost desert. Almost. And this is uh, numbers, data, uh, actual information. So I seen, unfortunately, uh, countries like in, in Europe and uh, maybe even in America, unfortunately, this is not something I'm happy about, uh, becoming um, un uh, inhabitable for the people. And I see UAE as going greener every day. So you see more trees, you see more green energy, you see more energy in people coming to these kind of events to support this. So. For sure, I, I look at the UE to become greener by the day. Uh, even there is so much competition, but there is so much room still for business. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, business here, although it's based in the UE, but we are working globally. We have office in the US, we have office in Africa. We are operating everything from Dubai, and procurement side at least. So UAE is like the hub of the world now, basically, especially Dubai and been here almost 12 years and very happy and uh, like I said, we're going greener. If you see me coming to official event with t-shirt and normal <laughs> sport, <laughs> because I love living here and I enjoy my life the way I want. It's not forceful, nobody's forcing me to come with a certain dress code or a certain, forgive me, I'm not against anything. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, being in life happy and doing what you want, this is the ultimate happiness that I can see.